All right. Whoa. How's the volume? Where should I hold it? Great. Great. My name is Galen Boone. I'm an art jeweler. And Sarah Darrow and Brand brought me in to do an artist talk um, about my series called Third Sex, which I made for my senior thesis leaving art school. So, in a primordial jungle of Eden, a quartet of mysterious gods stand and lounge before us. Carved and sculpted cow bones sits jewel-like in heavy silver vessels. Iridescent beetles stand in formation on velvet palm fronds. And a collar of copper lyre's tongues lies heavy against the neck. I am not a minimalist. I find the vein of desire and value in my work comes through tuning into a frequency that delights and excites me. My aesthetic sweet spot is the electric disquiet of in-between spaces. The peculiar spots where the alien becomes magnetic, where beauty and perversity collapse and tangle, and where ambiguous bodies violate the binary and are deified for it. So since I was asked to do this talk about desire and value in my jewelry work, and in my third set series, I've been mulling it over and trying to distill what is the magnetic center of what I do. And I feel it comes down to kind of remembering, almost on a body level, of earlier unmodern ways of being. We have to do a double computer thing. And I'm a horrible millennial. In my early 20s, I was very briefly an archeologist. Sarah Darrow was around for that. And I'm so inspired by armor and regalia from the ancient world, from empires and eras when people were making jewelry in order to incarnate ritual power in dialogue with the gods and to mirror the splendor of heaven and earth And people made jewelry and temples and offerings in an understanding of the earth and cosmos as the divine. Can you guys hear me? I'm moving my hands, great. Yeah. <laughs> For example, gold and all metals are literally heaven sent. So all the gold, silver, copper, and iron we've ever touched, or soldered, or sawn, or hammered, or lusted after was rocketed into the body of our home planet from the exploding hearts of giant stars in their death throes. I shit you not. This is a real image of an exploding star. And these molten cores of expiring mega suns are the densest things in the known universe. And that's where jewelry comes from, because jewelry is magic. <laughs> so I didn't use any gold in this series or particularly expensive materials. I used like copper cloth, bone, and insects, but I did call upon archetype, taboo, arrows, and devotion to make this work feel like sexy and valuable. So, one of the four deities, the mother, archetypes of birth and death, I got two colors of bone, nipple shields, and a menstrual pore. So, the collars are made with cow bone ethically sourced from a woman uh, backyard prairie in Kansas. And I cut them all in the bandsaw and made cabochons. Uh, the nipple shields are copper with bone milk spilling out. And then at the bottom you'll see there's some blood happening. So fierce, fecund, free bleeding, spilling milk from their breast. Carnal and carrying death. For each birthing of life carries in it the seed of dying and to be born is to be promised a demise. And this mother exists long before the Madonna and long before the whore, before the split that came in early Christianity when at the close of the sixth century, Pope Gregory I, a notable woman leader, 
Shakti divorced the good mother from her pleasure, sexual agency, and even the act of sex itself. When he gave a sermon casting Mary Magdalene, Jesus' benefactress, and the apostle to the apostles, as the original unrepentant whore, nothing wrong with that, and that Mary, the mother of Jesus, was improbably a virgin. Both new doctrinal developments, both Marys, may have been surprised to learn about 500 years after their deaths. And then that dissonance, that psychic terror becoming doctrine, becoming embodied in millions of people for hundreds of years, thousands of years. No one's getting knocked up via light in my paradise. And so in my culture of origin, which is soaked in Protestant rejection of the body, this mother is not a normal, good, or virgin mother. Instead, we have a biologically ambiguous, outrageously queer and tattooed divine feminine. At home in a distinctly femme Eden, who touches on older, more whole fertility archetypes. See Inanna Ishtar. I feel a kinship with author Maggie Nelson and her framing of the sodomitical mother. A mother with access to non-normative, non-procreative sexuality, to sexuality in excess of the dutifully instrumental. In other words, a mom who enjoys kinky queer sex for its own sake. So this mother is an antidote to the vindictive masculine sky god of the Old Testament, an anti-venom for the devastating, often rapidly violent sexism that is the legacy of patriarchal religion in the West. And it's eye candy, you know? It's like, give me pleasure to make these feel like devotional objects. And all carved Yonic shapes, uh, the inner collar is the tomahawk steak that finished the breaking, like I was a undisciplined vegetarian, and that was the final straw. The sirens, seduction and repulsion. We have insect collars and loincloths because I love a loincloth. These sirens are the seductresses, vixens, the harlots even, Eden, even of this Eden. They are odalis entwining on the forest floor, enticing and a little alien, glowing in the dark underbrush, magnetic, beautiful, gleaming and covered in bugs. And these two embody the power of attraction and how close it can come to a virgin. Their beauty is charged up with swarms of insects in an aesthetic push and pull. Actual prismatic beetles and cast bronze cockroaches. I love creepy crawlies because they can feel alien and otherworldly and can sometimes frighten us. And maybe this is why I feel a queer affinity with them. We're all beautifully designed and just a little bit misunderstood. Here the fig leaves of Genesis have become jungle fronds and pad-like leaves of embroidered velvet. Perhaps these sirens are the serpents of the garden and the forbidden fruit. The delicious fruit of the explicitly homoerotic. There is something taboo and culturally wrong about the masculine beckoning in languorous seduction. These babes are reclining, sure, less active, but not passive. We don't see the erotically prone masculine a lot in mainstream American culture, but wait, this is also a kind of remembering of older, stranger ways of living and being. The United States claims Greco-Roman ideals of reason and governance for its origin story. The founding fathers of valorized ancient Rome, a separation of powers in the role of the Senate, and so on. But the framers of our Constitution conveniently forgot one of the main mechanisms for the transfer of political and social power among male elites, pederasty. That is, literally, anal sex in symposia. I'm not joking, you can look this up. I'm a former archeologist.
Oh yeah, it's a close-up of the beetle collar on Zay. Um, so I took real Chrysochroa beetles from insectsale.net and I took the little bodies apart with antique dental tools and took their egg sac and guts out and um, glued them back together and strengthened them and filled them with sand acrylate and then made little bronze legs and sewed those all together with palm fronds. Um, anyway, <clears throat> and since long before the Romans went all in on going Greek, all human bodies have held feminine and masculine. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna stay on this slide. All human bodies have held feminine and masculine, and all have played seducer and seduced. This is a visceral remembering that all binaries collapse towards the center. By the way, this is photographer Alexander Wong. He was 20 years old when he shot this series. Except for I'm a photographer of anything with him in it and the quality does suffer. So this is me. Um, as the warrior, archetypes of war and pleasure with a breastplate, pubic shield, and collar of wires tongues. And this is me meeting my hermaphroditic soul bringing in Greco-Roman armor, ecclesiastical ornamentation, and luxe barbarism, with the thrilling ambiguity of a eunuch, but more virile, hopefully. And making this panoply of intimate armor marked a transformative time for me. I was 28 by the end of my time in art school, and I consider myself normally gendered for most of my life, but things started shifting around the time I turned 25, I moved from New York to uh, California and suddenly felt a whole lot more butch. And I started understanding my own gender crudeness better, started giving myself permission to step into my masculinity more overtly, and I started unlearning the need to choose to be a woman. Um, confusingly, this was just five years ago, I'm now in a femme swing, so gender is fluid. Okay. This lovingly made suit of armor is protective and sensual and reveals while it obscures. It's strong, very butch, but there's also something soft about this warrior. They're not threatening or here to seduce via aggression and holding a ripe, open pomegranate. The fruit of sacred and profane knowledge, death and the underworld. In reflecting for this talk, I see more tenderly that this incarnation for me, whoops, excuse me. In reflecting for this talk, I see more tenderly that this incarnation for me wasn't just sacred and cheeky androgynous embodiment, but also a tiny erotic utopia. The pectoral pubic shield and collar of liar's tongues are all antidote and anti-venom for living under patriarchy and under sexual threat antidote to being socialized in the objectification and disempowerment inherent to girlification, an anti-venom for being groomed by the overculture to be sexually trespassed against. Not here. This is my fuck that. Audrey, Lo Audrey Lord, um, near canonical black lesbian feminist, spoke in the erotica's power that, as women, we've been raised to fear the yes within ourselves, our deepest cravings. So this set is devotional regalia for my own pleasure warrior self. Invoking ancient forms and techniques, hammer raising the breastplate and tongs, pinking copper nip nipples with vitreous enamel, and chasing and representing tendrils of pubic hair, glorious as a Catholic sunburst crowning a saint. Throughout human history, queer people have been linked with the divine. Uh, in, third, uh, in Third Kingdom Egypt, Middle Kingdom Egypt, there's a third gender called Sekhet. In ancient Mesopotamia, the temple 
uh, priestesses, often they were like trans women. And you know, all over the historic record, we have evidence of queers in the sacred. And in a moment in which queer rights are eroding, I want to re-deify the people and bodies that violate the binary. And all of this series is an ode to loving my and others' congenital queerness, our gender shape-shifting, and our inability to abide by certain social norms. So these are my artifacts for an imagined ancient past in which people had a more direct relationship with death bodies in nature's wild underbelly. Maybe about process. I started writing this with a whole bunch of process shots and then realized I was going to talk in 45 minutes. history and um, I read a lot and I'm pretty ADHD so I buy a lot of books read the first third and then put them down but I learn a lot that way <laughs> and um, it's just over once I there's something that clicked in college taking anthropology classes about the relativity of what's normal as I was figuring out that not only was I not straight, I probably wasn't bisexual either. And um, it just kind of exploded that the more omnivorous I can be with um, the information I'm taking in, especially about other people and other kinds of people, the more I can figure out what's actually true for me. Um, so I, I also, oh, I uh, was the Wingate Fellow for 2019, which is a craft fellowship. And so they gave me, I think it was something crazy, like $15,000, and I spent it traveling in Europe and in Mexico looking at collections of ancient jewelry. So I started in New York and went to Sweden, Denmark, uh, Venice, Turin. There's an armory in Turin, which is amazing. I'm a, after all this time, I'm finally fermenting just taking a new art a jewelry series, which is like Joan of Arc being potentially trans, which is also legitimate, potentially. And um, like martyrs and mystics, and like feminine forms of knowledge, like plant allyship and chainmail. So um, yeah, I've like feasted my eyes a lot as well. No, I worked at the farmer's market, so it was free. <laughs> <laughs> it's real? Yeah. The outside, too? It, it's from little peanuts. Oh, yeah, it looks like enamel. No, I didn't make that. <laughs> we ate it. But um, I, when I was in New York after I graduated school, I stayed in a um, human medical antiques apprentice. So I did a lot of defleshing of fetal, fetal, I'm actually probably not supposed to say that out loud. Um, you can't sell white human parts, you can only sell dried human parts. So I had a hand in that and retooting human skulls so that they look like they had a full set of dentition and went very deep into gothness for a couple of years and one of the one of the jewels I took from that was a really beautiful set of 1920s dental tools. Which are great because little hooks in the wiggly bits help you get the egg sacs out of the beetles and they're like oily and they are stinky and they smell like bad beef jerky. <laughs> 
so they gave me, uh, I was the only senior with my own room for my studio because I was also carving cow bone, which is a big no-no, like it's a carcinogenic, um, the pad is carcinogenic because it's got burrs on it, so you, if you ever work with bone, you need to have a particulate respirator, so I'd use a wet belt sander and then clean all the time, um, but I was like the stinkiest senior at California College of the Arts for sure. Well, because they were sexy. Because they were beautiful, like Hulk in the hand. Yeah, Venus and Taurus. <laughs> Thank you. shop apprentice for a little bit before I went vegetarian. Um, let's see if there's anything. You know, I don't know. So I think there's something that I find really important about the body. And so the, the meat was delicious working at a high-end butcher shop in Manhattan. And there's something really intimate. Um, so as an apprentice, you start with doing, you do what's called cleansing. So you have a, like almost like a scimitar shaped mini knife, well not mini, but mini scimitar. That has a curve that so helps you get between the skin and the muscle. And the sort of fibrous fascia on top. And there's something, and they kind of led into I can't remember if that was before or after working with human remains. But there's something really intimate about it. There's something about the mind-body split that comes out of the Abrahamic tradition that do their best in an amazing way to remove like the sweat, ecstasy, spunk, and heat from life, like where life comes from. So it's going to be important also like I'm really interested in musculature, clearly. And the little boy nipples, mouse nipples. Um, I realized that I changed the slide on my laptop and not this one. So let me just. Yeah, I'll talk about that slide. Yeah, I love bodies. And it's also a journey being raised female and being raised in a sort of distrust around my own body. And then, as an adult, decided to take proactive and artful steps toward embodying myself differently. And both my parents come from like religious cults. My mom grew up Seventh Day Adventist and left the church. My dad grew up in a liberal cult called Creative Initiative out of, out of Palo Alto. So I didn't realize that there was so much religious iconography in my brain until I started doing this work. <laughs> Thank you guys. Oh. One more thing, I will be having a booth tomorrow if you want to touch some joy. I forgot to bring these, which is so silly, but I'll have like pounds of sterling silver for your jewelry. Thank you.